So we are live once again. Welcome to our second episode of Resports Rundown. Uh, I'm your host, Isaac. And this is basically a show where we just go down the most recent uh, matches in every, almost well, every active uh, scene going on right now. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm Isaac. I watch mainly like League of Legends and Apex and Overwatch, but those two scenes aren't right now active. Uh, and on our left, we have Awesome. Uh, say hello. All right, and to my right, I believe, is Eric, this way. And on my bottom left, I have Andrew. Yep, and unfortunately, uh, Memo isn't here. Uh, he's not feeling too good, so... Uh, we will miss him. But, yeah. Um, apparently, I'm having... What? I'm having audio issues. I am having audio issues. Uh-oh. Let me fix it out. I'm sure Discord is an unvoice meter or something. Yep, there you go. I think we should be okay now. Uh, do we have to do the introductions again? Yeah, scuff set up. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. All right, T special. All right, let's let, let's just let's just go. Let's just go from left to right. So we'll start with Awesome again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, my name is Awesome. Uh, I'm the player manager at IT, and then also the game lead for Valorant. And the esports I mainly watch are Valorant, Overwatch, with a little bit of CS:GO, and sometimes League of Legends. Okay, and I'm Isaac. I play Apex. Uh, uh not for school anymore, but. Uh, I still play Apex competitively. Uh, I mainly watch League of Legends, Overwatch, and Apex Legends. Yeah, hi, I'm Eric. I play for the Valorant A team. Again, I mostly watch the uh, Valorant CS, a little bit of League scene. And... Hey, I'm Andrew. Uh, I'm the treasure for IT, and I play mostly Valorant and League. And I'll be covering the League esports scene with Isaac. Yep. And as you know, we are uh, a bi weekly episode. So this is our twenty uh, February twenty first episode. We had one all the way back on the ninth. We had a school uh, school uh, day of school off, and we covered uh, basically League of Legends, uh, Valorant because those scenes were just starting up, and Apex. I had a special guest on for Apex because ALGS was starting back up, and uh, it was all fun and games. You know, it was pretty fun. But remember, this is a bi-weekly episode, and it will go live on WIIT the, fri uh, the Friday after this episode is recorded. So for that, it will go up on WIIT on the 26th of February. Uh, be sure if you're in Chicago, uh, listen in on that. And if you want to join us and you're not, and you don't know that we're on Twitch and you're joining from radio, we're live at twitch.iit uh, eSport, e uh, twitch.tv slash IIT eSports. I am forgetting words now. Uh, we are live. Well, this uh, this series is live every two weeks. So our next episode will be on March 7th. Uh, catch us in for that. And when since we had introductions over, let's move on to League of Legends. So for League of Legends, uh, we're going to start with the LCS. Now, the LCS is kind of a really interesting scene. We have the standings right now. We have 10th place is CLG, 9th Golden Guardians, 8th FlyQuest, 7th Immortals, uh, and then tied for 5th. Actually, not even tied for 5th anymore. 6th is now EG. The graphic is wrong because they, they just finished their matches today. 6th uh, is EG, 5th uh, is Team Liquid, and we have a three way tie still for 2nd with TSM, Dignitas, and 100 Thieves. And the sole control of 1st is C9. Um, so the LCS is kind of a really interesting scene, I would say. They had a pretty big mix-up after the uh, lock-in tournament with TL slipping and C9 actually the runner-up in that tournament being in sole control of first place. Uh, I mean, what do you what can you even make out of this region, to be honest? Because TSM got dropped out really early, and now they're second. Yeah, 
I don't really know what's going on a lot of the time because a lot of teams seem to be experimenting with different things. Um, they're trying out different strategies, different patterns for their team comps, like drafting different things for different people. Especially if you watch a Tigan and Toss, you see them drafting a lot of different interesting stuff. So it's been really interesting to watch. Um, a lot of cool things like showing out, like Kane, even in jungle, and Tristana in mid lane or stuff like that. So I think it's really fun to watch right now. Yeah, and speaking of Kane, let's talk about uh, our first team. That is a big surprise that everybody thought wasn't going to really make it all too much. Uh, Dignitas. Uh, Dignitas was, you know, power level to be a very bottom mid tier team, and uh, apparently Dardoch is playing uh, the alphabet game with junglers, pulling out like seven different junglers, and as you mentioned, the Kane pick, and now Kane is being actually kind of a priority pick in NA, and. I think that's because of the the gank potential and the, the fast clear that he has. So uh, he can get his solar laners ahead and play, you know, more of that uh, support type of get your people ahead and, you know, play the game out from there. Yeah, um, I've been really impressed with Dignitas overall. I see a lot of good things from Dignitas. I see Fake God and Sligo performing pretty well. And obviously, they play around on Dardock really well. And the team overall just seems to co um, cohesively play really well because they know what to do together and they really like to play around Dardock, obviously. And by putting Dardock at their center, they play around the map really well. They take objectives together. And because of that, you just see Dignitas thriving from that. And hopefully, you see a lot of more good play from Silico and Feka, both of them more the younger players that you haven't seen much of. And with that continued play, hopefully the veteran status of like Aframu and Dardal can lead them to some more victories. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting to watch these guys because Fake God and Saligo, they're not new rookies. They've been playing for a while, but they're just young. And uh, seeing them grow is actually kind of very, it, it's paying out for Dignitas because they've been on Dignitas for a while. Uh, even then when there are like, when Dignitas exists, they're on developmental scenes. And now that they're in the LCS, they're proving their worth. And uh, they're 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 trying to become more independent of, uh, from from like the ju supporty jungle type style where they need their jungler to stay top side or they need their jungler to like help them in mid, and it's uh you know it's it's panning out for them really well and um it's really interesting to see them grow and hopefully they're on they're going to continue this winning pattern because they did drop a game, um you know to C9 the the first place team that's that's you know, the predicted, I wouldn't say obvious, but it was very heavily in C9's favor. Uh, but they just picked up a win against, who was it again? TSM. 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 Yeah, TSM. And they're, they're on like a huge win streak, they're on a four game win streak. And uh, I mean, that's like a pretty good segue to TSM. Let's talk about TSM. Uh, Bjergsen <laughs> as their coach. Uh, it looks like his coaching style is getting up, getting into um, TSM. His, their mid laner is basically picking these staple control mages, and and they're just winning through a uh, great macro play, and just like how Bjergsen would you know usually want to play has. Yeah, what do you know? Poe is really good at this game. Um, he's gotten a quadra kill on Azir in one of his recent games, and they look really good overall together. Um, I know Sword Art is trying to mesh better with the team, and the Sword Art lost bot lane obviously a little bit shaky at times, but you still see them improving day by day, and I honestly think that's big. Part of the reason why TSM is also improving steadily. And because of that, um, because of how TSM is playing so well together, they have they got a four game win streak up until today where it got snapped by Dignitas, obviously. But honestly, it wasn't even that bad of a game. Um, like the Dignitas TSM game looked very much in actually in TSM favor until obviously like Spica got stolen like at Baron and at Dragon twice. So because of those coin flip smites just went away from them but honestly i think tsm still looks really good and um huni playing more tanky top laners supporting the team they look like they found an identity that they want to play around yeah and it's um you know sword art is also warming up to na i think he realizes that his teammates are not as good as uh world's mm -hmm. finalist suiting gaming uh but uh, he, it seems like his shot calling and his macro play is also starting to come out. It's nice that for them to have an actual like shot caller this time instead of it's like Bjergsen playing through mid lane as their support, where he has a more, uh, you know, he's more accustomed to having vision on the map. He has a really good sense of where the people, uh, where the enemy team is. 
Uh, so TSM, you know, looking really strong, and I hope they do, you know, keep winning. Because if they don't, their Reddit's going to explode. But <laughs> that's <laughs> that's that's on them at that point. Uh, so let's move on to Team Liquid, our third team in, of point of focus, and really unexpected. They looked really strong in the lock-in tournament, even on week one and week two. But then they, well, not really week one. They did lose to Immortals on their first game, but the, the other games they showed pretty strong on. Uh, but they've slipped. You know, they've they've lost like three straight before coming into this week, and no, they, I mean they're picking it back up. They're looking a little bit more like their usual self. It looks like um, Alfari, you know, he's getting these lanes uh, ahead. So he's getting his lane ahead. He's getting his jungler, you know, covered top side. But then when like mid game macro starts, they kind of fall apart and they don't know what's going on. So uh, they're trying to fix it. And then they're winning against, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting these games, C9. When he's against C9, yeah. they really played again. They really played well with their top lane, Alfari. Getting the lead ahead and then just absolutely taking over the game. Uh, it looks like they're trying to fix it, but I mean, they're a little shaky sometimes. Yeah. Um, right now, I think the bigger issue is that Tactical is having a bit of an iffy time through the past few games. Um, he looked like he was dropping a few like easy opportunities where he just like just gets caught out or like is not doing enough damage for the team. But otherwise, like I think Alfari and Sword and Torin, like despite them being new additions to the team, they look really, really good. And obviously, Core JJ being their solid like um, staple on that team, I think this team can do really well. It's just that they look really shaky right now. They're probably working on some things between like how they want to play the game. And if Jensen and Tactical play consistently and play really well, I don't see this team ever losing. Yeah, and Core JJ, as you mentioned, he's drawing so many bands. They no team wants him on playmaking supports because when he's on these playmaking supports, he absolutely just rolls teams. He he gets really good engages. He he calls them out really well. But when his team's not ahead and they don't, you know, know what's going on really, um, they kind of just like flop over and lose. I wouldn't say they have they wouldn't like just give up, but they don't really put much of a fight up. Even when playing from behind, they don't do much. Uh, so they really need to get their their game together the early game together and when they're ahead they look dominant when they're behind they just kind of like are like a mid-tier team so i want i want to see a little bit more comeback potential coming out from team liquid uh afari is doing really well santorin i mean he's a he's like a you know a staple jungler sometimes he has some breakout perform performances but in, during this split i think he's just really steady he's like that uh the like the foundation of their team and Core JJ, you know, his back row is super good. His his engages are really good. He has a good vision of team fights, but um, sometimes they're just not all on the same page. Yep. All right. I would definitely look out for your Team Liquid in the future. Like, they look like they're going to be back on the rise, especially after this Cloud9 game today. Yeah, and they don't have that much uh, games left, actually. There's only three weeks till uh, midseason playoffs. So for them to come back into the limelight and into form now it's probably more important than them suddenly becoming really good in in, in uh in the playoff bracket so really really good looks for them yep uh so that's it for the lcs uh i think we run down some teams to watch my team to watch would be team liquid as they claw their way back out of fifth and probably i still think immortals is a really good and fun team to watch there. Jose Diodo is still proving that he's one of the top junglers in NA, and they're really mm. fun team to watch because they, they kind of clown Fiesta sometimes. Yep, uh, I agree with you on the Team Liquid pick there. They look like they're going to be coming back and they're going to be pretty strong. Um, I think a fun team to watch right now is actually Dignitas for sure because of how D Dardog is just siling on <laughs> all the NA junglers, and um, I think he's going to be great. So I think if you want to watch a fun team, definitely Dignitas is the team to watch. Yep, and as we wrap up, I'm going to recap the standings. At 10th place, we have CLG. 9th place, Golden Guardians. 8th place, FlyQuest. 7th place, Immortals. 6th uh, is actually Evil Geniuses, not 5th. Uh, fifth is actually Team Liquid. Tied for second, we have TSM, Dignitas, 100 Thieves. And in sole con uh, possession of first place is C9. So now that we're done with LCS, let's transition over to the LEC in Europe across the pond.
Uh, so these are the these are the European standings. The Europeans we have tenth is Team Vitality. Uh, eighth we have Misfits and Astralis. Sixth we have Excel and Shock and No Fear. Uh, fourth we have SK Gaming and Fnatic. Third Mad Lions and still tied for first Rogue and G2. Uh, so let's start actually at the bottom this time of the LEC. Let's talk Astralis. Uh, Astralis is looking really strong. They just got their new mid laner, Magic Felix, and he basically single-handedly made the Corky pick into meta. No one was thinking about picking Corky, and Astralis just picked it out uh, uh, for the uh, Zier counter matchup, and he absolutely looked great on it. And, I mean, they lost that game to G2, but yeah, Magic Felix made it look competitive. And, you know, when you're against G2 and you're a bottom tier team, there's no way that looks competitive. But he really did really well on that, and Astralis is looking like a whole new team. Yeah, Magic Felix is definitely giving this team signs of life. Astralis looked like they were just about to roll over, looking like a last place, like bottom two team. But thanks to Magic Felix, um, he was really well known through the European solo queue scene. I, he, um, I'm pretty sure he got challenger in every single role, so because of that, he was really well known for that. But um, I know his debut on Astralis wasn't as expected, but he's really showing that he can be the carry for their team, and it looks like because of that, Astralis will be able to win some games and hopefully maybe make playoffs. Yeah, and they're really, you know, don't let the 3-8 and eight score line fool you. Um, these, they, they've played, like, Mad Lions, they've played uh, G2, they've played Fnatic, and they make these games look um, really competitive. And sometimes they win out, like, against Shulka. Uh, Shulka was going into the week actually pretty hot, uh, not so much anymore. They've actually lost all their matches. But um, Astralis looking hot. They uh, beat a hot shock on No Fear. Uh, they beat X they beat XL. Uh, they beat Vitality. I mean, like, they're not a bottom tier anymore. And their scoreline may reflect that they're a bottom tier. But there's no way they're they're going to sit down there for long. All right. Uh, so let's talk about another team that is actually now... On a losing streak, uh, Vitality, uh, not Vitality, <laughs> Fnatic. Uh, the Fnatic. person that, yeah, they've lost to Vitality. I should say that. Um, so Fnatic, you know, they were looking good last ep last two weeks ago, like our last episode. They were looking good. They're being put together and throughout the week, and then they come into this week and they just start losing. Uh, really, I don't know what unclicked because they were looking pretty strong coming in last week, uh, but. They just look really disorganized, and I don't think they're adjusted to this Corky pick because everybody just picks Corky against them, and they just don't know what to do against the scaling. Yeah, Fnatic looks like they're a little bit lost, especially to that loss versus Vitality, and they obviously lost against Mad Lions as well. But that loss to Vitality really hurts, knowing that Vitality is not much, not a top half team. Um, Fnatic should be looking pretty strong, but ever since those two losses, they look like they're a, lot, a little lost. Um, I mean, I don't know what's happening exactly, but I'm pretty sure it's mainly because Hilly and Upset don't have that consistency that bring, that they really need to bring to the team. And because of that, they have sometimes these shaky games where they just look like they're about to lose. And obviously, Niski is the type of player where he likes to roam to other lanes to help the other lanes win. And that's his play style. So if the bot lane can't really hold their ground down, they're going to have a rough time because Wipo can't be 1v9 in all these games. Yeah, and Wipo looks like a really strong, like, you know, top foundation type player, but I mean, he's left on an island most games because the jungler attention needs to be sitting bot lane, and they're just losing, uh, you know, losing out on most ganks bot lane. So they're not winning those. And also, like, even if Whipple can get ahead in the top lane, they can't push their advantage. There's nothing to push. There's nothing to take advantage of because their jungler is perma sitting bot lane or perma sitting bot side, and you know. You can't you can't put any jungle pressure on the top side. You can't contest any camps, and it all just kind of spirals out of control when Nithy can't uh, is like eventually not able to do anything either, because he wants to roam. He wants to you know get his laners ahead, and it just doesn't work. And it just their their playstyle kind of just like crumbles. Yep. Uh, it looks like they really need to fix up a few more things. Yeah, and hopefully they can. I mean, they're a staple in the LEC and. It, it's kind of weird seeing these new teams, you know, up here. 
and then without expecting to see mm-hmm. old old guard uh, coming back. But you know that's just the 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 way that time works is that they're they're not going to stay at the top forever unless they adapt to the meta and uh, play well. So speaking right. of the new teams, uh, actually almost entirely a new team, uh, Mad Lions. Mad Lions, they're looking fantastic with El Yoya, their jungler. Uh, he was he's actually a rookie from Spain, I believe. Uh, he's really strong on these on these uh, meta picks like Udyr, Lilia. Uh, usually when you see a Lilia, you just inch your face off. But he's looking pretty strong on there, and he doesn't die. Uh, and also like the meta has shifted a little bit, and where we're seeing like gank heavy junglers like Kane and uh, Rek'Sai, stuff that can get ganks off really easily. And he looks really strong on those too. So I think M- Mad Lions are really adjusting to this uh, to the meta shift quite well and quite quickly. Yeah, I see Elioia playing really well. I see him doing a lot of good things on the map. And obviously this team is adjusting really well to play with him. Um, considering they haven't played at all until up until this season, um, this team was a bit of a question mark considering they let go one of the better junglers in LEC last season, but Elio is filling up the role really well. Humanoid looks really good, and Armut looks also really good as well, despite being they're also their new top liner. So I think a lot of good things are going for Mad Lions. They look like, because of the fact like the team is just rounding out really well, and they'll be able to play synergistically really well. So I see a lot of good things, especially with the Corky in the mid lane and Lilia in the jungle too, for some flexibility. Yeah, and Humanoid is looking really strong in this Corky pick. Uh... You know, Corky is relatively new, and not every team is accustomed to seeing him. And sometimes teams just don't know what to do, and they just kind of let the Corky scale for some reason. Uh, and he kind of just takes over games. Uh, Mad Lions actually do a really good job of if they're behind, or if they, or if a humanoid's kind of losing his lane, they'll let him scale. Uh, sometimes they'll let him pick the Corky into the Azir matchup, and it's just a snooze fest in mid lane because everybody's trying to scale. And when you're a top level team for facing anybody under you, you want you kind of want them to do that so you can because you know you have the better team fight sometimes, uh, depending on the team. But uh, most of the time you have the better team fight, you have the better macro play, and letting <laughs> letting the other team just scale while you scale as well is not a good recipe of winning if you're a bottom tier team. And it's kind of I kind of don't want to see like uh level one cheese all the time but when you're a bottom tier team you got to have something up your sleeve to beat these hot teams like astralis like mad lions like rogue g2 uh you can see like g2 kind of wavering too with the like any level one cheese they're just they they, they kind of laugh it off and play but it's it's they don't they're not expecting it at all yeah i'm sure they'll want to look at those replays and look at those buzz and go over those things but obviously, G2 just likes to take it in stride, and they'll just pick, play those games and think, it's, hey, it's one game, and it's over. And they'll probably, by playoffs, they'll be ready for more of those things. But I'm pretty sure in the regular season, they just want to have a good time. Yeah, and he doesn't want to have a good time, because they're basically the most winningest team in LEC uh, history. So there's no, the one game shouldn't really affect them, and they're still like one of the best teams in the, in the, uh, in the league. So uh, that'll wrap it up for LEC. Let's go over the standings once again. In 10th, we have Team Vitality. In 8th, we have Misfits and Astralis. Team six, uh, in 6th, we have Shalka and XL. 4th, we have Fnatic and SK. 3rd, uh, we have Mad Lions. And in 1st, we have Rogue and G2. Um, my team to watch, really, this these next couple weeks is Astralis. And uh, let's, let's like Mad. Astralis is definitely one of the top ones because they're, you know, growing. They're looking, they're looking really good, improving a lot week by week, and coming into the uh, mid-season like playoffs, I think they're, they're not going to take first, but they're definitely looking to upset many teams. And then on Mad Lions side, I mean, they're just adjusting to the meta really quick, uh, really quickly, and they're looking really competitive against the top teams. So I really want to see them push up in the standings against Rogue and G2. But uh, only time will tell. Mm-hmm. Um, I also agree with you on the Mad Lions pick. They look really good, and I'm hoping to see them in the playoffs and perform really well, and hopefully contest G2 and Rogue for their money. Um, the other team I would really 
look out for is probably Schalke. I know they've been looking a bit shaky, but I believe in their players, and I think they have good players to play around. So hopefully they find their form together and they'll be able to play well. Yep, and let's transition over to the LCK over in Korea. So in the LCK, we have uh, in tenth we have Sandbox. There's a three-way tie for seventh: Nongshim, Red Forest, Fred Abrion, and Afrika Freaks. Uh, fifth, we have the two telecom rosters, T T1 and KT Rolster. In second, we have Gen G, Hanwa, and DRX. And in first, we have Damwon Kia. Uh, you know, the first, and then the first, uh, and then the three teams in second. They're not really that big of a surprise. They were informed coming into the week and after the lunar break. They're looking really good. Danwon Kia still looks really dominant, still in world championship form. Uh, but I really want to go to the gatekeeping teams of KT and T1. Uh, let's talk about T1 first. Uh, they keep signing these 10-man rosters. And at this point, it's like a 20-man roster because they're just pulling their challenger players up from the, like, up from the challenger scenes. Like, hey, play in the LCK. Here you go. Uh, here's your shot. We don't look good, but uh, try to win. So, like, these 10-man yeah. rosters, I don't know if they're working. And I don't think they are working. It's definitely a thing of the past. Yeah. Uh, quite recently, they debuted their new jungler, Onair, from their Challenger League scene. And obviously now, are they an 11-man roster? We don't know anymore. They just look like they're lost. Like, their coach is obviously trying different things. And it makes sense during the regular season to do that. But outside of that, they really can't find any synergy together. I mean, I know Nair looked really good, but obviously they're playing a bottom two team in sandbox gaming. So, I don't know, maybe T1 needs to really pick up their pace and hopefully find something before playoffs starts. Nice, because they're playing with a different roster basically every game. And they, they, they need to find something to settle on and work out the kings, because they're right now just patching holes in a ship that's already sinking. Uh, so, I mean, their T1, their development rosters always look good, no matter what, even if the team's yeah. doing good or not. And yeah. those players aren't going to stay in a, in a dying T1. They want to move on to, like, superstar rosters, like Gen G or Hanwha or DRX. And uh, I, they just need to stop, like, bringing up these challenger teams because they're just, they, they're putting their talent pool out for other teams to grab them. Because, like, what, if you do well in T1, and then you get put back in the challenger scene. Why would, like, if you proved yourself already, why would I ever want to go back to a challenger team? I'm just going to join another team that's struggling, like Sandbox or Freak of Freaks. Uh, mm -hmm. So hopefully they can get their rosters together. Uh, let's move on to the other gatekeeper team, KT, uh, who, <laughs> unlike T1, is actually looking really good with their with X T1 jungler blank. Uh, she came back from the Turkey scene. And now he's playing his like signature picks. He's looking really good on a gank jungler. He came back at the right time, essentially, as the meta shifted away from these farming junglers, uh, like Udyr, into like a more gank heavy jungler like Kane, or you know Nidalee. He played Nidalee a lot. Uh, so for them, they're actually doing really well. Yeah, I think KT looks pretty good right now. They look like they can take over SKT really easily and at any point if SKT doesn't find figure out what they're doing. Um, I think Doran is really good in the top lane. Obviously, CB Max um, promoted Doran a lot back when he was on... Was it Griffin, right? I think, yeah. Doran? So, uh, yeah, yeah, Doran yeah, on Griffin. Yeah, yeah. Griffin. Yeah. Yeah, so he looks really good right now. And obviously, Blink is doing a lot of work for KT as well. I think Blink's like Visions game is one of the best or one of the better ones in the LCK junglers. So I think that's helping KT a lot play well around that. And hopefully, Yukel will also step up to the challenge whenever he's needed because obviously, there's a lot of good mid laners in LCK. Yeah, and I think it's going to be really hard with uh, you know the meta shift going back to scaling, and scaling is basically LCK style. So that snooze fest of 20-minute farm and then 5-minute fight and then you win the game, that's what LCK strives on. And um, I, I think this might be a really good way for both T1 and KT to start fighting for these top positions. 
Uh, it's not like they don't look competitive against like teams like Gen G or DRX. They do take them to game three. It's just that they they can't. They need to find one more piece to just finish out uh, these teams. And it they this meta is definitely going to help them uh, find it. Uh, so it's really exciting to see these two teams. They're really old guard. They're like season two uh, top teams, and now they're middle middle of the pack. It's not as bad as. Uh, or it wasn't as bad as last year, two years ago, LPL. But uh, it's the old guards are definitely going to come back, and I hopefully KT can find their um, their form with blank like they did with score. Uh, but we can only hope. So uh, right above them is DRX. That's the last team we're going to talk about in the LCK. Uh, DRX, you know, top team. They've always been a top team, no matter what season they are. It depends. It just depends on what roster they're fielding. Uh, so DRX looking really strong. They're basically a whole new roster. Almost basic, almost all rookies, except Pio6. Uh, Pio6 is looking really good in the jungle, though. Like, really good. He he supports almost every lane, not simul like basically simultaneously, but he's been like having really good lane presence, uh, really good ganks, and he actually plays the jungle really well. And that's what they revolve on. So uh, Pio6... Uh, let's talk about him. Yeah, I mean, Pyoshik's growth has been huge for DRX. Um, Pyoshik has been playing a lot of different junglers. He's obviously been performing really well. Recently, I know his Mundo played pretty well in one of his more recent games. And considering he used to be, I'm pretty sure, a kindred one trick, he's come a long way. And it really shows that DRX can play well around him. And I think another player to really like bring up is Bao in the bot lane as their AD carry. And he's really stepping up for them. He does a lot of the damage for them, and he brings the carry potential in their bot lane. So through that um, team comp strategy where they play around bot lane a bit more, and I think because of that, DRX will be able to perform really well. Yeah, and it's they're they're on a win, kind of a win streak, a hot streak right now. And it's going to be really exciting for them when they play against more of these top teams. Like, they have beat Hanwha, they have beat Gen G, they have beat KT. So the, really the only challenge left for them is Dam1, and they're looking invincible. So I, I don't know how feasible that is, but Dam1 still looking ahead of their time. Uh, doesn't look like any LCK team can contest them. Uh, they play like this like style that's perfectly counters the slow scaling style of LCK. They play like LPL, where they just skirmish a bunch, but not only that, they have like excellent macro, and if they fall behind, they know how to get back ahead. So... Mm -hmm. um, you know, DRX definitely in the front runners to challenge Dam1 for first place, but they're just too far ahead right now. Uh, but yeah, like these th three middle of the pack teams are looking really strong to upset anybody in the midseason playoffs. Uh, so uh, let's run down the teams again. That's it for LCK. 10th, uh, we have Live Sandbox. Tied for seven, we have Nongshim, Red, Red Force, Freddy Brion, and Afrika Freaks. In fifth, we have T1 and KT Rolster. Second, we have Gen.G, Hanba, and DRX. In first, we have Danwon Kia. Um, so my team to really watch, watch them improve, is KT. KT right now is on a hot streak with Blank, as we said. And also, Bao is looking really good as a support. So KT definitely should be moving up in the ranks, perhaps, in the next couple of weeks. But KT is looking really strong. Yep, uh, I agree with you there. The other team I think it's a launch right now is actually Gen.G. I think Gen.G has a lot of good players in their mid lane, uh, the top lane, obviously, in Rascal and BDD. So I think, uh, and with obviously the ruler as a carry. Um, so I think Gen.G will be challenging Damwon Gaming really soon. So I hope to see them put up a good fight and maybe give them a run for their money. Um, and I also got a question for you, Isaac. If you were the coach of T1, who would be your five-man roster? I think since since a lot of mid laners are playing control and scaling mages, there's no way that I wouldn't pick Faker. Like he is still one of the best mid laners in the world. He he looks amazing on scaling champions, and like Azir is his champion. It's almost like Rise, uh, if Rise was even good after his like ten thousandth rework. Uh, I definitely would pick Faker in the mid lane. Top lane, I still think uh, Zeus, even though Kana 
kind of is like on the sidelines right now. Uh, Kana is really dependent on his attitude and his, uh, you know, his his I would say like willingness to win almost, like his confidence in himself. He's when he when he struggles, he struggles really hard. But when he looks good, he looks really good. But that's just like too coin flippy for me. I still would take Z- mm-hmm. Zeus. He's a really promising rookie, and he plays really well in the top lane by himself. Uh, bot lane, I would really still go with Gumayushi. Gumayushi looks really good onto the Samira, the Kaisa, uh, Aphelios. Even though Aphelios is more of te- Teddy's champion uh, pool, Teddy's just not looking really good in the, in the team fights. He's kind of like throwing his ults like anywhere and everywhere. And they don't have that much of an impact in the fight. Uh, then for jungle, I think I want to I want to go on the uh, on like a little 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 risky side with Warner. Warner looked really good in uh, in live sandbox game. I know they're like the last place team, but Warner looked really good, uh, and he looks like he could cover up what Elam couldn't, and that's ganking. Elam kind of struggles in ganking. He's more of like the Udyr type of farm type jungler. And Wonder just looks really good playing with the team. With with the limited resources he had, he played with Closer and like Care and Teddy and Caria. Uh but then for support, I mean there's really only one pick. They didn't really put anybody else that's Caria. Uh right. honestly I really think they should get another support. Like maybe just bring up their challenger support because Carrier doesn't look really good. Like he looked really good on DRX, but DRX had like a whole different different team dynamic, and Carrier looks kind of lost on this team. He d- he picks these like engaging champions, but he's not the one to engage. Uh, he always looks for it, but then he like botches it somehow, and he gets caught out, almost like Wolf style, where he gets caught out warding sometimes, and it just doesn't look good. So I really want to see T1 pick up a different support, maybe one that's more in form. Or maybe just go to your challenger team because it looks like that's working. Uh, so my roster definitely would have a different support, but carry is the only pick. Yep. Uh, so like, uh, uh, what would you pick? Like, out of the twenty people they have, what would you have? What would you have on their team? <laughs> uh, I agree with you for most of those picks. Actually, in the top lane, I would pick Zeus as well. He looks really good right now. Obviously, Kana. Kind of was really good last season, but he's having some confidence issues. So until he fixes that, I would definitely go with Zeus. Um, in jungle, I also agree with you. Um, I don't know if his name is Warner or Onir, but um, I think it was Onir, but I'm not sure. So in the case that it, it's either or, I would definitely go with him, though he looked really good against Sandbox Gaming. And I think it brings new potential and new life to SKT where they lack sorely in the jungle, kind of, between Kaz and Elam, where they both look a bit iffy at times. Um, obviously, Faker. Faker's is the year. Ever since Easy Hoon and his year, or Easy Hoon's is the year, and Faker's is the year, we're competing against each other. Faker's is the year is, has reached new levels, and obviously, I think it still looks really good. Um, the only part I may disagree with you on is the bot lane, and I would probably bring in Teddy over Gumi The only reason why I do that is because I think having the veteran presence in the bot lane and in the mid lane will help overall for SKT to form because having a rookie jungler and a rookie top laner and then having a rookie AD carry as well will put a lot of pressure on SKT to perform, especially in like the more pressure situations like in playoffs or something like that. But having really secure veterans in the carry roles like mid or AD carry, I think will help T1 really play much better than they would if they had rookies in more roles than they than they wouldn't. So and obviously, Carrier would be the only support that I can really see so far. Yeah, I mean, we could talk about that too. Is like what support anywhere that like probably just from China to be honest, because China likes to come to Korea sometimes, and vice versa. <laughs> uh, what support would you like to see in T One's roster come next split or even next season? Honestly. Honestly, I don't know if there's any particular support in LCK that I would particularly pick right now that stands out to me. Um, maybe life. Life looks okay, but honestly, if I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised, or I would be surprisingly pleased rather, if someone from the LCS even came to the LCK, like maybe Core JJ or even Hui or Ignar. I'm pretty sure any of them could probably fill the role better than a lot of the supports that are in LCK right now. 
I think they have a lot of potential, and with their veteran presence, they would probably help SKT a lot more, especially in, like, shot calling. Yeah, and I think that you would kind of hit the nail on the head for me, too, is the life. I think life would be a great pickup for Gen G. I I really want T1 to pick a support that can shot call, because I'm pretty sure Carry has a really quiet support uh, in his player camps. He doesn't talk very much. He doesn't have, mm. like, that much engagement. Uh, so they're like, I, I, if I could listen to uh, LCK con, like T1's comms, I'm pretty sure they're like dead silent for like half the game. <laughs> yes, this and is it, true. And it's just like, I, I want like a shot calling support down in the bottom line of Core JJ. And it seems like that's actually the move recently for the last mm -hmm. couple of years is that the support mm -hmm. does a lot of the shot calling like Afro Mood does now with Dignitas and what Core JJ does with Team Liquid. Uh, so it looks really good for them, but I don't know that like T1 is just a really quiet team and they need some type of direction mm -hmm. to get them going. Cause it's not, it can't be faker all the time. He's getting old. I mean, he's not, he's only 25, but he's been playing League of Legends for like nine years. So yep. he, he needs a little, he needs, he needs a little bit of help, man. So right, right. Uh, let's, uh, let's wrap it up here. So for the LCK, again, we, we went already over it. So, I mean, it's a fun region to watch sometimes, but lately now it's like snooze fest scaling, and uh, yeah. you know, Demwan does bring a little bit of life into it, but it's it's been pretty fun. So with that, uh, we're gonna go over to Valorant. I'm gonna toss it over to Awesome for Valorant. All right, yeah. So uh, Valorant had a pretty interesting week. Uh, unlike, oops, sorry. There goes the uh, <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Uh unlike last week, uh the matches were um kinda delayed, at least in NA. So I believe they started yesterday. No. They're still going on uh, right now from what I Yeah, know. yeah. Yeah, so they're still ongoing. Um so right now we still don't have the entire bracket. Let's actually start off with stuff that is kind of outside of you know, um professional competition, uh and more so about the newest patch. So patch two point oh three came out. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of actually interesting changes. Uh, we knew that the Stinger and Frenzy nerfs were coming, and along with the Marshall buff due to the some some leaks. But uh, what we weren't expecting were uh Reina nerfs and Yoru buffs. So uh, let's actually first talk over these Reina nerfs. So her uh Q and E, the D Dismiss and Devourer, have gone from four charges to two, and then I believe they also cost more. Um, and then you can also, yeah, and then you also gain an orb, uh, if you get an assist within three seconds or something along those lines. I think it's actually the amount of damage you do. So, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on these changes for Reyna? Um, I like it a lot. I knew eventually that Ride would do, I will, I assumed Ride would do something because Reyna, I think, has like an insanely high pick rate right now, almost 80%, I think. Yeah. So a change was bound to happen because there you can't have like a agent that has like an almost eighty percent pick rate too. I like these changes, like they kind of force her to be less selfish because she doesn't have as much healing and stuff. And yeah. I think the change is that if she damages it doesn't matter about the assist or something. As long as she damages them and they die within the next three or five seconds, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I think it's three seconds. She gets the orb. So I guess this the, the first of all, the um, the amount of orbs she gets now, I think it kinda now those selfish reinos can't be forced to like make those you know those youtube highlights and potentially in the game yeah you know, too because you can't you can't just like brainlessly peek in 1v5 because you only have two orbs now generally, mm -hmm. generally speaking most of them will just probably heal once maybe dismiss a second time it's mostly probably heal twice yeah i think also like something interesting about this change is it's kind of like an indirect buff to the Reyna ult too, because before she had four charges, right? Or four orbs. Yeah. So you had one for essentially every kill. But so when you use your ultimate, all you really had was the instant regeneration and then uh, the fire raid now, right? But now the new ult just essentially lets you play Reyna like it was pre-patch where you have as many, you know, an unlimited amount of, you still have an orb for every kill you get. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Yeah, and I think another thing too, interesting to know, uh, I think you kind of touched upon this earlier. Uh, it is a buff to team play. Um, I like technically her power level overall has been kind of nerfed, but something interesting interesting to know is that like let's just say in, in like a pro game, um, 
you know, someone else, like, Lorena does most of the damage, but someone else got the kill, and you can't really blame the other person. It's not like they're gonna stop, because they're not gonna risk, you know, losing that, losing that gunfight. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in pro play, I guess, or in team play in particular, it, it's better because, you know, you can, you just need the assist to get the orb, and you don't accidentally screw over your Reyna, but... Uh, like overall, the power level is still pretty nerfed. I, I could, I like, I understand why they nerfed her. It's just interesting because I felt like in in ranked, like obviously she was definitely really strong. Uh, but in pro play, not so much. I think this honestly, at first in the beginning, I was like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know about these changes. But I think over time, I'm kind of warming up to them a lot. Makes the makes the game a lot like I guess less selfish. You actually have like an yeah. actual player in the team now. Before yeah. you, you just pick, they just insta lock it, right? Get like the best aimer, BC, go whatever, insta lock mm -hmm. it, and then they don't do it. Sometimes they don't do anything for the entire game. At mm -hmm. the same time, it also nerfs those that actually did do something for the game. So you kind of have to, mm -hmm. again, you know, it's more team oriented mm -hmm. now. So yeah, these changes are pretty good. I like them. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think these nerfs also like kind of change the way she plays, especially on like piss rounds and stuff? Because I feel like mm -hmm. she has a lot of early game or early round potential. Um, because, you know, she she has two orbs, she gets the kills, she's able to, you know, snowball off those two orbs. But then after that, she just is kind of, kind of has no util. So, I don't know, I, like, I feel like that dynamic changes a little, right? Because she runs out of the orbs immediately, and then, you know, late game, she just has no util whatsoever. I mean, still speaking, she does have at least that one heal, right? So regardless, mm -hmm. if she can get the kill, she's still going to be 150 HP on the pistol round. Right. So I don't think maybe like the entry is still the same, but like you said, late game it's gonna be different because she you now she can't really constantly heal back up. Yeah. And, and and obviously she can't really get like a decent a good better gun like frenzy too if she wants more heals for a ghost. Yeah. So, so yeah, I guess. But then again, she was always known to be very strong in pistol rounds. Mm -hmm. So this is a good nerf. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the Yoru buffs then. There's not really um they definitely made a lot of changes, but I'm not really sure how much it's, they're gonna uh, they're gonna affect. Um, so they changed his E ability, the gate crash. I think that's the the official name of it. Mm -hmm. um, they changed it so that on the map it shows you uh, when it's seen from opponents and when it's heard from opponents. Um, so you know, pretty small buff, more of like a quality of life thing. Yeah. I feel like it's not really a buff in the end. Yeah, I don't think the design is. It can be improved on, right? Like the the footsteps I like a lot, but at the same time, there's you're so limited to do what you can because yeah, you you, you can you can easily discern like just like it's a decoy and see, like I said last episode, you can discern if it's like a fake or not just by probably the rhythm of the footsteps. Right. I think they, I think they tried to make it like better, right? They tried to make it so you can't really fake it, but in the end, they're decoys. They have like a a standard pattern, and right. sure people will adapt to it. Like I said, if you can fake like drops or like stuff like that, it'll be huge. But as of now, if you're just faking footsteps walking forward, it's gonna be fake. Say you're in a one v one situation, you have a Yoru on the enemy team, you hear footsteps, ah, that's probably fake Yoru. If anything, maybe the Yoru would giga brain and make you think it's a fake Yoru. But at the same time, most likely it's not gonna help too much. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And then I think they also made a, a few changes to the ultimate too. Particularly, you can't body block in the ultimate anymore, and then also the map isn't covered up uh, for you, so your teammates can see who you see, and then you can also see who your teammates see. So, uh, um, see, see, this ultimate is what I think that, like, well, first of all, I don't think Yoru is actually a duelist duelist because when you can compare him to the other duelists, all the other duelists have like the ultimates, they're like self sufficient, right? You got the right, right. self but raise with the alt rocket. Uh, jet with the knives. I feel like Yoru's is more of a lurker style because of his ultimate and like his teleportation. So I wouldn't yeah. really classify him as a duelist, but maybe it's probably the closest to a duelist because there's not really like a lurker, like a lurker think, class right now. I think generally one of Yoru's biggest issues is he is a character that like wants to outplay, but the issue is that his, his outplay utility is has one glaring weakness a lot of the times, right? So let's just say the teleport, for example. One, the teleport is really loud and telegraphed, and then two, it's not fast enough to actually escape, right? Because mm. um, if you consider some of the other duelists, uh, so, like, Jet has a dash, Reyna has a dismiss. Now, kill, uh, not Killjoy, Raze and Phoenix, on the other hand, they don't really have, like, escape abilities, but they still have more abilities to really enable them, and, like, or all their abilities, like, in one way or another, enable them to, you know, uh, convert into a frag. But I think the issue with Yoru's teleport is that it doesn't, it, it's kind of meant to 
could be an escape ability, but the issue is that if you're in the middle of a gunfight, it's really hard to escape without actually just being punished for it, you know? I, I just feel like it's too telegraph. Like, there's just one thing you only can do. Yeah. You can only do so much with, like, a teleport that very slow to travel, goes really mm -hmm. slow, and up on top of the enemies can see it. I think it's just way too telegraph to, like, actually do anything yeah. with it. You have one play, and that one play has, like, a 90% probably failure rate unless you properly flash. You can ordinate, like, an omen flash or something like that. Which yeah. again can be difficult, so it's just yeah. I don't yeah, know. I think it's still very early because I know we. But then again, the past agents that have been released, the only successful ones so far, I say, are Killjoy and Reina. Sky, not too much success. There are some Sky one tricks out there that are top leaderboards. Sabrosa, I know, is also advocating Battle Sky because her her flashes are better than Phoenix flashes. But in the end, she's still not seen that much compared to like the other released agents like Reina or Killjoy. So yeah, maybe the next agent will be a lot better. I think I I think something to kind of note though is like the the thing with Sky in particular is that I feel like she kind of has a purpose, but the purpose is also to like bridge the gap between the two other initiators that already exist, right? So like she kind of bridges the gap between Silva and Breach, but Yoru on the other hand, he kind of exists in his own realm, but he's also so vastly different from the duelist. Like mm -hmm. kind of like you said. In the beginning, he's not really as much of um, a duelist as he is more like an initiator, but his initiating abilities also are not that great because he doesn't have a lot of great setup setup utility compared to, you know, all the other initiators. I don't know. I just feel like, generally speaking, right, Sky would be great in a team comp, but in the current state of Valorant meta, in the maps, usually those five team comps, on um, some maps you want, like, a raise especially, and then you want, like, some right. black, smokes and sent sentinels. By the time you have all that stuff down, especially you want a Sova too, right? Because Sova is probably the best agent in the game. When you when so, when you fill all those slots, you already have five agents. There's no other room for Sky for that other yeah. extra flash healer. Because mm -hmm. like maybe you can sacrifice like a duelist, but then again, you're running with one duelist, which is going to be pretty hard to like start it's entries nice. and trades. Maybe like yeah. second entry, especially if you want to split a map, split a side too. So mm -hmm. I just feel like five agents. I like the way like the agents are working on, but sometimes the roles there's just not enough agents in general to like fill out for all these because like, all these this guy's like a very niche pick, I guess. Yeah. To replace, but like at the same time, if you want to pick Sky for flashes, why not pick Breach instead? Breach is like designed for that. Yeah. And, and if you want recon, why not pick Sova? Sova can do that even better. It's just that Sky and it's just a combination of that. But like you can't. Yeah. But like in the end, if you want flashes, but you also want a healer. Maybe have a duelist pick flashes instead and brings like Sage or something. I don't know. She's right. just way too. She's oh. too much of a jack of all trades. Yeah. Like it's just master of none. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. And so let's talk about uh the next thing in the in the patch notes. So Marshall buff. Um, I feel like the impact of this has yet to be seen, but it's kind of interesting that they did decide to buff the Marshall in my opinion because I felt like it wasn't overly weak. Um. Maybe it could have seen more playtime, but I, I, I didn't. I felt like uh, its strength wasn't really an issue. Um, so they made it so that you can move at ninety percent speed when scoped in now, and then also, um, you scope I think three times zoom in now rather than two point five, and then also, uh, it's a hundred dollars cheaper or a hundred credits cheaper. Uh, so yeah. What are your thoughts on these changes? The movement speed and the price changes are really good. What I don't know about is the three point five times scope because I don't because I tried it in game, and I really don't like it. It's mm. just it's weird. Like it doesn't. Some people say the scope before was too little. Right now, I feel like the scope is too much for a scout. I guess it would yeah. be nice if like it was a scout. See a scope where you have two zooms, but at the same time, it's just I don't know. I don't know if it's a buff or it's a nerve. It's definitely a buff at the same time, but the 3.5 times scopes might actually limit some people because some people actually don't like it. You know, they're used to 2.5 times scope. You yeah. Close range, you can play at long range. I guess it's not too hard to play long range, especially with the insane fire rate. 3.5 scope is, I don't know. It's also very map dependent because, um, like, for example, that might be fine on, like, a map like Ascent, where, you know, you can just watch down mid or mm. Haven C long. But, like, on a map like Split or, you know, some areas on Bind, maybe not Bind be long, but, you know, other areas of Bind, it's just, it, it might be a little suffocating, um, say, overall. But I feel like on on maps like Ascent or, uh, you know, some areas of Haven, it might be, you know, a welcome change. Um, but, yeah, I think overall, like, we still have kind of see what the... um. 
overall effectiveness of this buff will be. I don't really think it's going to like push it into like you know a dominant pick. It'll definitely be a lot more viable, but it's not going to be like the new stinger or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I don't think there's going to be any. I don't think it really has that ability. Uh, but yeah. Speaking of the stinger, um, stinger and frenzy gets a nerf. The frenzy not as a big one, but the stinger. Um, on the other hand, does now the frenzy nerf only gets a hundred dollar price increase. So, you know, buying frenzy armor on a pistol round not as viable. You can still buy frenzy util, but um, probably not as uh, desirable. Uh, Stinger actually gets myriad of nerfs. So, man, I actually have to <laughs> remember what they all are. So, uh, sixteen lower, lower fire rate uh, price has been. It's probably increased, I think. I don't know. Yeah, the more fire rate, the more recoil. I think the the max recoil would like hit after six. I think it hits after four now. Is the mm -hmm. recoil has been increased for both the full auto and the burst, right? And lower rate of fire, so it is a pretty big nerf. And yeah, completely needed because that gun is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, but I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really boring. It's really boring sometimes to see how every pro player just buying. Light armor frenzy, and then next round, all oh, you lose four sub stingers, and even the uh, yeah. team one, oh, let's buy stingers because Spectre is trash compared to the stinger. Yeah, like for five rounds, you would just force buy, and then yeah. until someone can finally get a full gun round. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I mean, it, I, I really like that they went for both a price increase and you know, actual changes to the gun because if it was a price increase, that wouldn't have changed much because you could still, you know, keep force buying over and yeah. over again. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think a little bit of both is is pretty good. I like these changes overall, and I feel like um I haven't personally played a lot of games uh since this since this uh, nerf, but from what I have played, it definitely does not. I, it definitely doesn't seem as prevalent as it was before. Um, mm -hmm. same thing with the frenzy. Uh, but to be honest, I still see it from time to time just because mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, as, as of as of now, the Valorant devs said that there's nothing with the frenzy. The biggest problem was just light armor frenzy. But now uh, that thing's still gun. The frenzy is still kind of a ridiculous gun. Like, it's uh, something about it is still way too strong sometimes, even in the closer quarters range. Yeah. Like the running of gun potential, the running gun potential with it, and then I don't know. I've been double. I've been double dink so many times across the map. It's actually I don't know. Maybe the second bullet is just nuts accuracy. I guess nuts recoil. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that I think before something kind of interesting about the frenzy was that I mean, right, it, right now or not, I say right now, but um, before this patch, it was about being bought with armor a lot. But I think back when you know Sinatra was talking about how good the frenzy was, he would just buy you know util and then uh, a frenzy, and I think that type of strategy is a lot more viable. It's definitely a lot more niche now than it was before, but I think you don't really need armor to get the value out of it. You can still use util to get into people's faces and just you know mm -hmm. play aggro pistol rounds like that yeah the armor was just kind of insurance but like yeah. very very good insurance that would almost guarantee like the one gunfight mm -hmm. yeah okay so then that kind of covers all the patch changes now let's move on to the na region um there were a few uh roster moves so firstly um big changes for Anbox. they you know, they had a couple of changes so one Rebo has been officially signed for Anbox, Poach potentially being dropped, and then uh, Android is actually leaving and joining NRG. Uh, so yeah, what are your thoughts on these changes? Wouldn't that mean Poach would not be dropped if Android just left because they only have four? Yeah, players, right? I think he's. I think he actually is still playing. Um, but I, the way I see it, actually, mm -hmm. uh, finish up your thoughts and then I'll go over because it it's. I have like some thoughts on like why this is the case, but yeah. uh, I don't know. Unlucky for Poach, I guess he was always one of those solid players. But I guess they needed a player to drop to. I guess they definitely need some changes because Endbox was kind of struggling. So yeah. new new player Rebo, I heard he's nuts. Mm -hmm. Unfortunate Poach had to take the downfall. So and Android leaving is actually gonna affect Endbox a lot. Like Android yep. is like, insanely strong. Him to NRG. It's just an all-out loss for Endbox. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I haven't. I have, we have yet to see Rebo perform or anything. So we'll see if he can re replace Android. Yeah. I mean, the the way I see this, um, 
I don't know, it's kind of interesting because you know Poach was benched, and then now that Android is gone, um, it, it feels like Poach is probably still going to be involved in this team at least for a little bit. Um, the way I see it is, it kind of feels like they weren't expecting Android to leave. Uh, mm -hmm. I think maybe there was some sort of disagreement with the team, um, and you know Android decided to leave, joins NRG because he had the opportunity, especially with all the infinite stuff going on, and then. Because of that, and Box was like, "Well, we still need somebody, and Poach is still under contract, so I guess we can play him." Um, to me, it's kind of interesting in the first place, though, that they decided to sign uh, Rebo instead of Poach, and not because Rebo is bad, but I just felt like one of the bigger issues with uh, with and Box was like the amount of firepower on their team. You know, just like the 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 crack kids, um, essentially like. They they were pretty tactically strong, uh, sound, but they were definitely lacking a little bit in just fragging power. Um, mm -hmm. And them adding Rebo, I, uh, to me, that didn't really fix the solution, right? It just kind of felt like the same thing with a, a different name. Like, maybe they have a new IGL with a little bit more fragging power, but it just didn't feel substantial enough to actually inspire any confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I don't, again, it's like a new, brand new team. They're making Ross changes, trying to figure out what works for them. They got to do start doing some scrims soon. And then when the tournaments start coming, then we'll be able to see how they do. As of now, not to everything is just on paper. Doesn't look too good. But maybe in person, there is like some secret, amazing chemistry between these guys. We'll find out. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. So then, uh, not, what do you call it? Now moving down um, to the next thing. Uh, Phoenix One, another organization not paying their players. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, so I've heard this from I have a friend that plays for formerly played for Phoenix One. They're like a small tier two org, I guess, that won a couple of tournaments. I think the Knights, the Knights Invitational, and another small tournament. Totally, they should have received approximately 1300 US dollars, which, from what I've been told, none of the players, including a 15 year old guy on their team, have actually received. And they're they have left the, now they have left the org the org has stated that they've been paid for con through their contracts but apparently none of them have actually seen any of their money and it looks like, it looks like even the org already had some scummy things behind it like they before the Phoenix One org was like actually part of the Sentinels brand they just took it and rebranded into Phoenix One and now yeah, no, thirteen hundred dollars from two tournaments the org requested the money to be paid directly to them which they said they'll pay the players and now the, none of the players have actually been paid which is unfortunate huge a little bit of drama 1300 is like not a small money not small it's pretty huge especially for a 15 year old kid that wants to like maybe upgrade his setup too you know yep this is i mean it's, it's yeah that's that's definitely a substantial amount of money i mean this kind of is just you know um another like symptom of Esports, like the esports industry, especially you know new esports and uh you know not tier, non tier one, even in tier one esports, this happens from time to time. It's just the scene, you know, the scene right now is really open, and there's not enough relegation to prevent this stuff from happening. And you know, some org some organizations are going to be really scummy about it, and they're going to take advantage because they see it as a way to make a quick buck. And if mm -hmm. things don't go well, they just can hoard money if they need to. They disappear straight into thin air, go no contact with anything. Yeah. Just un just unfortunate situation for all of them. But now apparently they've been signed to another org. We still have yet to hear an announcement from them. Mm -hmm. But all their players are very good players. The fifteen year old guy right now, Zekin, I think he's ranked twenty right now on the leaderboard, mm -hmm. so nuts to him. We'll see how they we'll see how it works out. Yeah, so um, let's move on to the next thing. Uh, so T1 officially released Brax and AZK. Um, I think last time we talked about this, it was a rumor, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's been actually official. Uh, we kind of talked about this before. I don't think we really want to go into, you know, them the actual aspect of them being dropped uh, as much. But where, what do you consider some potential landing spots for this team? This is really hard to think. Like, I don't know. I would love for maybe one of the t maybe TSM right now because I think TSM is kind of struggling right now with some maybe definite roles. I think you got a lot of them who are on duelists who are playing like maybe controllers, especially Sabrosa. When I feel like he should be playing in duelists instead because he is a lot better at entry and getting those picks too. But then, now I, what about 
drone. That's what I feel like. There's too many like there's there's a lot of players there that are just in their like in their sub sub like sub roles, you know. Right. Um. Uh. Maybe. That's. I wouldn't say inbox. Maybe inbox <laughs> would not be. Well, I guess maybe they wouldn't consider inbox to be like an ideal team for them. Right. If anything, um, what are teams are struggling right now? I can't really think because all, all all the teams right now seem pretty solid. Like, at least in terms of like cohesion, I guess teamwork, except for maybe like TSM. But TSM was like a group of, so I guess, sort of close friends too, right? Right. So kind of hard to separate the. Yeah, I mean, I think there's also, I think this has been like been thrown around a lot in like social media and stuff, but the possibility of them kind of forming their own team with like other people that have been recently dropped. So like Poach, for example, but I'm not really entirely sure how that would turn out. That would be a terrible, terrible idea because they need, yeah. in the end, they need to like form a team. So they want, they want a team somehow, right? Mm-hmm. It's just unfortunate yeah. T1, T1 is just not, just for T1 is just not the team they hope had. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I feel like for me, it would be really interesting to see if there would be some way to, like, uh, slot them into phase. Now, the issue is that phase, uh, I don't think they're going to break up because they're, it's a very similar situation where they're all friends, they're all former Overwatch players, so they kind of just want to stick together. Um, but it's just that I feel like players, at least not these players specifically, but, um, players like them can be added to a team like FaZe and, you know, change them a lot because right now FaZe is literally just, they they just always want to be doing something. And they it's really hard watching this team because they are, like, It's just the a worst. Pug, it's a pug yeah. At this point. Like, you just pick the five players in ranked and then just had to form a team and play against tier one team. That's yeah. Like, they're, like, like the... Like, they're like the worst team ever that like actually ends up winning like games from time to time. It's really it's really weird. And I think like it, it's interesting too because Corey recently had an interview and he's like, yeah, the reason the way we are is because most of us come from Overwatch, so like we always have to do we always have to be really active about whatever we're doing, so we just don't like waiting. But I think the one of the biggest issues is that one they don't really have a coach, especially not one from CS, and then they only have one CS player, so there's no one to really drill that into them, you know. And I think. People, someone at least like Brax and uh, AZK could, you know, help them uh, out in that in that sense. Um, I would yeah. say more of Brax, potentially AZK, because AZK is a lot more like I'd say more experienced, older, maybe a bit more mature than Brax. Brax is a talented prodigy himself, but again, he's known in CS to bait pretty hard, not maybe at the entries. So right, yeah. potentially maybe AZK would bring like a lot more to the team in terms of like tactics. AZK was a great support player. You can probably he's probably learned a lot from like maybe Steel and Days, so he could probably bring that too. Then again, you could say the same for Brax, but I feel like maybe in teams Brax just does his own stuff, and he gets those gets those picks. Yeah, that's fair. Um, okay, yeah, and uh, you kind of brought up TSM earlier uh, uh, on this topic, but. Uh, let's talk about their challenge performance. They actually did not qualify. They did not make it to the main event for Challengers 2. Um, actually, let me double check what team they actually went on to. I kind of forgot. Um, events. Hmm. Oh, Dignitas. Yeah, they actually went on to Dignitas. It was really interesting because, um... Oh, sorry, not Dignitas. Uh, Genji. They went out of Genji. It's interesting because before Genji had actually never been TSM. Uh, it was like TSM was a Kryptonite. That's you know the narrative that was going around. But TS, they they beat out TSM in a two one map. Now, uh, what do you think were some big issues that like TSM were facing, and what do you think are some really good things that Genji did here? TSM. I don't think TSM has like a dedicated like Sentinel player. Like they like to run comps without the Sentinel, Triple Duelist, the Sky, the Omen too. Maybe a Sova, but they don't. I don't think I can like name a player on TSM that will play a Sentinel. Maybe Hayes yeah. has played Sentinels before, but Hayes is more of a better Omen player. He's a lot smarter with Omen and potentially better. Cutler is like a more of like an initiator. He'll play the Sova. Who else is going to play Sentinel? You can't put the you can't put Sabrosa on Sentinel because his aim is nuts. He can enter you really well. Drone, you can say the same. Drone or Wardell, Wardell, he's an opper. Maybe he's putting a jet. Drone, he's known for his great Phoenix, so 
they, they're lacking they're lacking like a dedicated sentinel player they just have like maybe two players that have like concrete roles you have one of them that's like a, maybe in a confused role which is sub rosa i'd say and then maybe a hazed and hazed and cutler cutler was always on like initiators and stuff hazed on the other hand will stop between omen or killjoy it's just i don't know it's just yeah they're just lacking like a, like a dedicated sentinel mm-hmm. player that will help them really well maybe yeah they can drop one of the players pick up brax because brax has been playing sentinels too you know and i'd say they're all still friends because they all come from a cs background too that's probably going to be a decent roster change i say but again these are all on paper stuff we don't really know yeah. what's going on in behind the scenes and stuff yeah and i think something else to kind of go off like the lack of dedicated rules thing is that they also do not have um as far, if, as, far as i remember they don't have a dedicated igl right they kind of swap between um who's calling uh on one map depending on what role there's that's being played and i think that's also a big issue you can kind of see that um that that lack of structure from like the performance from map to map i think also something kind of interesting to note is that um before especially like during last challengers tsm looked pretty strong on icebox they lost i, I remember they lost their game but they looked like they're making really good improvements towards icebox um specifically and then here they did not look that good and i don't know why it felt like they, they were kind of going backwards um as of now i think sabrizo's role is to lurk and stuff but the problem with his is that he doesn't have like the discipline to like lurk properly i've seen so i compare him to compare his lurking to steel steel can create the same space as sabrosa at the same time he can take less duels you know less 50 50 duels but he can still take the same space because steel is a lot more disciplined a lot smarter too than sabrosa sabrosa i guess maybe he wants to go for those highlight plays or something like that which can't really help that much at the same time this is why i think he should be he should be one put on a duelist instead but then again, I can say the same for Drone. I can say the same for Wardell. It's just a lot, a lot of different roles, you know? It's just, you know, I don't know. It, it's it's nice that this team got so far, but now you can see that their, their lack of sense and all is starting to catch up on them. Before, they were on top because of their teamwork and their experience together. But now the other teams are starting to learn, starting to catch up, starting to scrim more, starting to get more experience, you know, learning the game more. Their lack of sense is starting to bite them out back. Yeah, I mean, I think this last week has kind of shown like how quickly the that gap is narrowing. You know, a lot like, I mean, we'll, we'll get we'll talk about this later, but 100 thieves losing to LG, and then you know, eventually getting out of the uh, the uh, getting out of the event overall. So that also is something that like to consider when talk when bringing up that conversation. A lot of these teams are so like the teams that are. Con- previously considered tier two are catching up to these tier one teams a lot. It's not just any tier one teams, it's teams like Sentinels, teams like, you know, 100 Thieves and TSM. Um, that gap is like closing pretty fast and I'm not sure if TSM is like able to catch up with that. I think for the other teams, when it comes to Sentinels and 100 Thieves, especially Sentinels, they've made the adaptations to, you know, quickly catch up to um, what's got like the, the way that the the meta or just the game itself is changing and tsm um is a little bit behind in my opinion mm-hmm. yeah like i've been like like again most of the victories is because wardell just straight up stepped up to the team put it on a back and just dragged them to the finish line as of now it's no longer the meta is no longer triple duelist let's win all the aim fights the meta is now you need you need a sentinel to hold the site you need to like learn to play those retakes you need to get those picks too it's just it's just the air of tsm dominance i don't know if there's even one in the first place but they were the top top three team in the world now they're now they lost to gen g who aren't even top five right now yeah we'll see yeah um okay and then lastly uh let's take a look at the this bracket actually real quick um we now and this is still ongoing. Uh, the no- the let's talk about some of the notable matches. So Luminosity taking out 100 Thieves. 100 Thieves going into the losers bracket here. Um, yeah, and I don't know. This game to me seems the this game watching it just seemed very odd. Um, Luminosity did a really good job. I feel like uh, they were able to turn around a lot of a lot of you know um, situations that were definitely in the favor of 100 Thieves and just win rounds they had no business winning. Um, now some of that obviously to the mistake of or were big due to mistakes of 100 Thieves, but I think a lot of it also had to do with just how great Luminosity was playing in, in some rounds. 
Um, on the other hand, Hunter Thieves. Now, last time, last time we talked about how Dicey was kind of underperforming, um, even though you know Nitro wasn't in. Uh, but I think this time around, Dicey was actually, you know, playing playing pretty well. It was more Asuna was that was kind of underperforming in this mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. Those are exactly my thoughts. Dicey really stepped it up. He was side of the show. How wrong we were, I guess, last last time. Yeah. Yeah. This time, this time he showed it up. Now, now also know who we praise is going down now. I guess. I mean, he was on a stage one time, which I don't think I've ever seen him on stage. He, yeah, I mean, you. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because it actually kind of reminds me. So, actually, taking a look at their something that is really weird to me. I feel like Hundred Thieves is kind of they. They really need to learn, not learn, but they really need to figure out something for Icebox because, uh. On their Icebox game, let me actually pull up their composition because I remember looking at it and it was really, Nitro, really weird. Nitro was on the Omen, Steel was on a Kyojo, Dusty was on a Jet, Hiko on a Sova, and Asuna was on a Sage. But yeah, so that's yeah, that's why I think it's interesting. I feel like it's really weird um, that they decide to go for both the Killjoy and the Sage. I feel like Steel kind of just needs to, um, you know, pick up the Sage on on Icebox here, and then you know Asuna is should be able to like able to play the reina you know his, his reina is great and reina is actually really good on this map um i, I don't um, really i kind of i don't i kind of disagree with that i feel like St mm. steel is a lot better with a lot more information oriented agents right like yeah for the killjoy so in a killjoy I, i've seen many good great setups with killjoy like you can hold down b pretty easily you can hold down a really easily the problem with icebox is that you need to have a sage in order to like get yeah. you know, kitchen control that's what i do not like about it because in the end, if you pick this map, you have to play a Sage. Otherwise, the moment you lose control, I feel like the round is almost lost because that Kitchen Control controls most of B, most of CT spawn, maybe even like mid control. It's just an insane spot to have control of. And the fact that yeah. this Sage is like able to like, you know, straight up single-handedly deny that, I feel like the map needs to be adjusted. I kind of tend but... to agree, but... It's just that my where my where my opinion differs is that I feel like the way that Icebox is kind of kind of well, the way that Icebox plays out is that I feel like what's happening is that Steel is kind of reaching the limits of his playstyle when it comes to the, like the Killjoy on Icebox, and mm -hmm. because the Sage is so imperative, um, I don't think it's really doing Hundred Thieves any benefit to really put Asuna on the Sage. Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't think he can't play the Sage. It's just that. It's not his play style. It's not his play style, and it's just that if you have him on a character like the Reina, it, it, it will just improve their icebox so much more, you know? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, and, his, his role is literally the entry fragger, and they decided to put the entry fragger on, like, an agent that is not supposed to entry. It's just, I... It's especially just, on icebox. There's not, really, of, there's not really that much options to choose apart from the obvious one, which is Steel, but again, Steel's Killjoy and his Cypher is amazing i have we haven't yet seen the sage yet yeah. but i would assume that considering the way sage on defense is just you wall off mid go play somewhere else that's not i don't really think that's a style i think his style is just to sit on a site and just wait until like the last moment and then they start rotating because he likes to lurk he likes to yeah. catch those rotations i feel like his role is that i don't think i don't think you know sage really does that because he can't really tell if they're gonna rotate with sage yeah that's true that's true you know i, I what do you call it i think we kind of brought this last week. We we talked about this how Sage really isn't um mm -hmm. a Sentinel character. She's more, you know, she she kind of plays more like an initiator, and sometimes like in EU they kind of play her like a duelist. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think part of that is kind of one of the reasons why Steel is so um adverse from playing Sage because, you know, like like you mentioned, there's not really a lot of info gaining tools that she has. Now, that being said. Say Sage on Icebox is like one of the few times where she is played a lot more like the Sentinels because she's all she's very good at holding down areas on Icebox specifically on other maps. She can hold that she can slow down like a push or something, but it's not as good as holding down an area when compared to the other Sentinels. Mm -hmm. Um now Icebox that's different from the for the reasons I mentioned before. Um This is this could be an interesting change. What do you think about potentially Hiko on the Sage. I don't think overall that's like something that they should do, but I think that's something that like they could explore. I don't know. I I don't think overall it'll have great results, but I think it's definitely like an explorable option and mm. I could be proven wrong. 
I'm not too sure. I I think Hiko Silva is just way too strong in order to take him up the stage. But then again, this yeah. also applies. Hiko Silva is insane. This mm-hmm. also applies to almost every single player. You know, like I see on the jet, we've seen him on stage before. He did not really perform. Asuna, you can't get him off the Rays Arena or Phoenix. He's just too good at entering. Nitro again, Big Daddy Nitro. His smokes, his plays, his flashes, his brain. I don't, th- I don't know. If you take him off smokes, who else is gonna play smokes? You know. Yeah. So kind of just locked in that role. He goes over, like I said, sent steel, sent in sentinels, set up sentinels. Again, I don't know. Though this lack of agent pool is kind of hurting them right, in a sense. For Icebox, on every other map, if it was as long as it wasn't Icebox, they will win. But or at least contend in. If it's Icebox, it's definitely their weakest map. So maybe the team, maybe other teams will start abusing this and play Icebox first because other teams are starting to run the Viper, Sage, yeah. Sage, like agents, which are like S tiers on Icebox. And yeah. the fact that 100 Thieves have yet to still adapt to this is a bit concerning. Yeah, I think the Hero Pool thing you, you bring up is also really interesting because I think like Nitro and Hiko, as far as I know, from like, as long as this iteration of the team has existed, they the, like they have only played Omen and Silver respectively, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and not not to say that like they should they shouldn't be on those characters. It's just that they're so like like in in this type of situation when you know like a sage would be so helpful on this map. Who 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 takes it over, right? Because everyone else is just you know also in a similar situation. Mm-hmm. Well, then again, we have yet, we haven't really seen the intro play officially on Omen on any other Asian, but Omen maybe. Yeah. I don't think I've seen. Him. I think he's only an Omen player. I yeah, think. he he's only played Omen ever in in an official matches. Interesting. Yeah. And I think he go to ever since this version of the team has been formed. I, has could, only, uh... I could honestly see him as a Sage player because of his play style, but like then again, who's gonna pick up the smokes? I have. Yeah. I mean, maybe I don't know because if you talk about like maybe running, maybe running Viper, then you could potentially have like, um, Eco forego the uh Sova and just play the Viper instead. But then you know you lose out on the Eco Sova. Um, mm-hmm. maybe you have Austin on the Viper and he plays Viper a lot more like a duelist in a lot of situations because you know you can go for those isolation plays with the wall, but mm-hmm. then you're running out on the ability to cut off. Um, or yeah. you know, the, the, Viper, the, Viper, the Viper Mollies are very good too. Yeah, so I don't know. It's very they they had to figure out Icebox. I I think something starts off with some sort of like uh role adaptation from either like Steel or Hiko. In my opinion, it ha- it has to be one of those. I don't think either of them are are bad players on like you know the roles that they play. Uh, overall, it's just that on Icebox particularly. Whatever they have right now, I just don't think is working out too well. I think they're it just they're starting to see the limits of, you know, of of like the stuff that they've been doing for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their their lack of Asian pool is starting to hurt them. Just like TSM's lack of defined roles. Yeah. Every, every every team has a weakness, so hopefully they can start they can overcome it. Maybe they'll make like a very very drastic change and like just start practicing pretty hard. We'll see. Yeah, time will tell. Yeah, and now the next notable match. Um, let's actually talk about Sentinels and then Hundred Thieves. So this match actually just got done fairly recently. Sentinels two owing Hundred Thieves here. Now, honestly, Sentinels are kind of running a clinic, especially on Ascent. Um, which is really weird because Ascent is kind of considered um a lock in for Hundred Thieves when it's Sentinels versus Hundred Thieves. But this time, I mean, it seems like. Sentinels were outclassing them in every way. Uh, yeah, what, what were your thoughts? Six Murphing again on Phoenix. No idea yeah. why he was ever on the Sage. He's a great on Phoenix. Yeah. I guess even on Sage, he was a pretty good. Yeah, so, he was insane on Sage, too. Just a general great player. Yeah. I mean... Uh, that's pretty much it. The entire entire game, all I could see... In a sense, all I could see was just Sick just killing everyone. And his stats show that, too. He had, like, almost 150 combat score above everyone else. Yeah, I I think something to note too is that there were definitely instances where hundred thieves were, you know, not properly adapting. Um, especially on the on their attacking side, I felt like they were kind of running into a brick wall. Except for like, 
the last like couple of rounds um which they only really won like one of those last few rounds um but mm-hmm. it, it, it it just it it kind of felt like overall it's not that 100 thieves like entirely um was playing worse than they were before they definitely were in in some rounds but i i think it was more along the line the sentinels were, were just by far the better team yeah like, hundred thieves were also losing too many gunfights a lot of one, yeah a lot of two v ones two three v ones they were just losing and like a lot of times they were flank they were being flanked too even though they have the sense yeah. and the trays i guess were just not there and even when they tried to flank zom's daps had the read on them yeah Dapp, dapper sorry not daps <laughs> yeah i think also uh we talked we talked about this before but um, it was kind of a continuation from yesterday where Asuna was just not, you know, looking that great. Um, you know, he, uh, oh, what am I trying to say? Yeah, uh, uh, like, and, and on their on their attacking half, they, Asuna was, like, not to, you know, emphasize scoreboard, but, you know, it, it definitely is something to, to bring up, but Asuna had, like, two kills at the half, and then literally, like, his, de- his defense was a lot better, but his impact on attack was not very high. I think a lot of what, like what was going on was that they just were simply not able to take enough space on you know wherever Asuna was pushing because he was just kind of underperforming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, maybe again, every team has those slumps. This is one of the things we're looking at. Hiko yeah. not playing as well as we thought on the Sova, as we hoped, not as we thought, as we hoped he would do because you know he forms in Sova. His utility usage, his knowledge, and his timings of those arrows are always great for the team. I just guess it's just not, it's just not translating today. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah and then uh, so that's really I think the only notable matches for um the bracket. Now I guess we can go over a couple of predictions for you know um tomorrow. So we know that this screenshot is slightly outdated. Exet did win against Luminosity in the lower half, so. Uh, X will be facing Sentinels. Um, who do you think is going to win this lower bracket uh final here? Sentinels or X? Uh, I love both teams. X is probably like it's, it's, a, it's a dark horse. Like they're mm-hmm. they're all of them are very very good players. Like Arvin, we did. They're all great players. But I just I, I don't think at this point, just based off like the way the teams are performing in like past tournament stuff, and when they show up, I still think Sentinels are going to win because yeah, I would tend to agree. Still the number one team for now. Yeah, I mean it's kind of interesting to note like yesterday, um, X had in their match against Envy. Envy they lost two zero. One map was thirteen. I think map two was thirteen seven, but map one was thirteen one. They mm-hmm. definitely were not having a good day. Um, you know, then they beat X uh, Hayes Clan, and then now uh, we they are where they are today. Um, I don't know so, whether or not that match was just them underperforming or Envy just you know completely having um their number. Interesting, uh, right? Yeah. Interesting, right now that the I just remembered that the VCT right now is being played on a previous patch, so the Stinger yeah. Arena Frenzy Nerves are not here yet. So mm-hmm. Sentinels still have the upper hand because they are the one that introduced the Stinger Frenzy meta as of now. Mm-hmm. So potentially, maybe when this patch is over, we're going to see some different results. But as of now, yeah. they're still being played on the old patch. Right. So Running Gun Stinger Go Burr Frenzy Go Burr is still there. Yeah. Yeah, I think I kind of tend to agree with what you said. Uh, Sentinels, I think, will take this one. I think they've just been looking really good this past tournament. Now, you know, obviously their match against Envy was close, but they did go out. But I think Sentinels are the type of team. I mean, it's like the Sinatra Classic. You know, you go into the lower bracket, you make the lower bracket run, and then you just absolutely do well in the uh, in the grand final. Um, speaking of the final, uh, so upper final, who do you think will is going to win that? Envy or Immortals? Oh, this is hard. I th- yeah. Envy. And even Envy finally looked pretty good because they decided to put food on Duelist and he's showing up hard. He's a, he's playing very, very well. Immortals, same with Immortals. Both teams are playing. Shot up started to pick up the breach now. I thought that the rain I thought the rain of changes were still I thought the rain of changes still haven't gone yet. So the fact that he's still playing breach is interesting. Like yeah. pocket pick? No one I get I don't think I don't think anyone could have seen his breach picking coming because he's the only yeah, I mean... guy, right? Yeah, I, I thought he was only like a, a Reyna one trick essentially. It, it's really weird because their coach was like, "Yeah, like I don't agree with the Reyna pick, but he, he's just good on it, so we just let him play the rain. Yeah, like I, w- I was always thinking, but I guess now maybe they, they potentially they might be actually using this to practice for the upcoming patch. 
because I was like, I was like, I was like, oh, it's interesting, you know. Like when I first looked at the results and, or the picks, I was still like, it's interesting, you know. They they have they have shot up on the breach. Oh yeah, the arena patches are coming out. Then I remembered, wait a minute, they're still playing the old patch. Ran Earths aren't there, so why is he picking the breach? Maybe he finally decided to look at it, listen to his coach and help the team. But at the same time, he was also helping the team with his arena. So I don't know. Maybe we might see the Reina back against the against NV, or maybe the breach pick will be permanent after the patch is over. Yeah, it's gonna be difficult uh, to say. Both teams are playing very, very well. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's really too close to call. Um, if I really, really had to pick one, I feel like overall Immortals might be the team to go for. I just feel like when Immortals are on their, you know, when when Immortals are feeling good, they're just they're just rolling over everybody that's that's what that's what it feels like to me and mm-hmm. you know if you can if you count on something like that happening tomorrow i think well if both player teams are playing at their peak like tomorrow i think overall immortals are the ones that i would just have to favor you know mm-hmm. yeah again we'll see we're excited for the mm-hmm. match tomorrow and let's hope yeah all right so mm-hmm. now let's move on to eu um not really a lot to talk about in terms of mm-hmm. roster changes or anything um, you know, OG finally officially signs Monkey Business, and uh, Happy actually reported to leave uh, Giants. Um, now, Happy leaving Giants is really interesting because Happy is considered to be like one of the you know better players in EU. Um, so him leaving Giants, I'm not really sure what this means. Maybe he's going to another org. Maybe there was some sort of falling out. You know, we still have to really see. There's a lot, of, yeah. There's a lot of stuff that we can't really say unless we have the insider information. So now it's just speculation at this point. Yeah. Um. And then yeah, I mean, we talk about OG versus Honey Monkey business. I guess we can talk about more about that later with um, well, when we go over the bracket. But let's first talk about uh, Team Liquid. Team Liquid failed to qualify. Um, again, uh, they lose to Alliance. Um, now, I think part of it kind of has to do with like their map pool. Um. It kind of just feels like right now, T1 has really mastered only, you know, a couple of maps. Their Haven still looks pretty abysmal, pretty abysmal. Um, their Icebox doesn't look bad, um, but I think really, like, the only... I'm not really, really even sure what map it, um could be considered the best. Let's actually... I'm going to take a look on uh, VLR real quick. Uh, if you look at their maps... Their highest win rate is on. Okay, this was not well. streamed, right? It wasn't streamed, right? Mm, I think it was actually. Was it? I thought it was. I thought it was played off stream. Because they went out to Alliance. Um, but I mean, right now, like Haven, uh, not Haven. Haven is actually their high, their their highest map, uh, map win, map. Wow, well, map win rate, but it definitely has not felt like that for the past few weeks. But after that ascent, is there? is our highest and from recent memory their ascent has looked good but i think overall it's just that i don't know their the map pool i feel like if it's not ascent or even icebox right now it's just it's too hard to you know go for like predict team liquid to win to win a map or or at least consistently win a map unless it's i thought team liquid got stomped at icebox they lost 13-1 no second map yeah this one they did actually but i i think overall their win rate is something like 83 percent on icebox interesting yeah this is actually their first loss on icebox yeah this past one was their their first loss on icebox interesting because usually they have i don't know at this point many at this point from what i can see it's just like ec1s is they 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 definitely need a more roster change because he's not really living up he had a good map on icebox he had a good he played decent on Icebox, but they, and then again, you can't really play decent when you get stomped 13-1. And in the, and in the other the next two maps, he barely, he couldn't even, he barely could get up to, he barely, um, I guess, went over 100 combat score, which is not that good because you can be an in-game leader and a support player, but at the same time, if you're, if your excuse is as, as a, because they're better, they're much better support players that are able to support properly. I see people, they're trying to defend him. They're trying to say that, you know, he's a support player, he's an in-game leader, you know, they can't really cut him because he's vital to the team. But we have, there's a lot of, like, in CSGO, maybe even in, in Valorant too, there's a lot of in, CSGO in-game leaders that are able to frag, get those impact frags, even trade properly. 
and he seems to be unable to do that. So a roster change is definitely needed. And otherwise, I, at this point, Team Liquid just not living up to their hype. It's just right now, I, I'm just saying right now, it's still Scream, maybe Cryptics, but the rest don't seem to be there. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest issues with TL has to do with consistency because I think there are some times where they just they just look absolutely great, right? So like mm-hmm. let's just say let's just say for example a recent a recent example would be the Red Bull Home Grounds tournament. They look really good then. But you know, then there's instances like this where they they look pretty lackluster, at least compared to what we know that they could do. And they there's there's something there's something that they have to figure out with this consistently. Now whether that's a roster change or whether that's like they need some sort of role swap, like I don't know, maybe Eccles. Uh, oh, Eccles really. Yeah. Okay. I guess overall he's playing the controller, but he plays the initiator sometimes. But yeah, what do you call it? I I, I don't know. Like, so there needs to be something brought into this team that like introduces more aspects of consistency. Because I know they're going for a long term team, but the or you know long term success. But the issue that I'm seeing is that it. I'm not seeing the signs of the long-term success because there isn't as much consistency as there should be, right? So, like, if they were, like, losing games and doing very, like, well in each of those games that they were losing, then, you know, I would be like, oh, like, they definitely have, like, you know, they're definitely, you know, getting better over time. They just need to figure out some small things. But it, it, it feels like sometimes some of these losses are just like, why are you losing some of these games, you know? Like, yeah. you, you have no business losing some of these games. Especially... Yeah as heavy as they do in some situation in some situations. I don't know. So right now this team look at roster compared after the, the reveal video they have yet to actually they have yet to actually live up to the hype, so changes are definitely needed. Yeah. Um oh right, yeah, moving on to another team that, you know, was kind of favored but also uh you know failed to qualify for the main event. So we have Guild. Um they actually did pretty well in their game against Fnatic. They went to map three. They also went into overtime on split for the third map. And then there's like the famous clip of uh, Yasin and I forget whoever else it is. They take B site with 10 seconds left. Yasin starts planning at five seconds and then he gets off for some reason and they just lose the game in overtime for that. And I don't know why, but um, I think overall Guild actually, like Guild was actually uh, playing pretty well. Uh, that last blunder obviously was just unacceptable, and I'm not. I don't even know what happened there. Um, they look pretty well, but I think overall, Fnatic just you know, uh, like was was a better team, and they just you know ended up winning. Um, yeah, your thoughts? I don't know, dude. I don't know. I don't know what happened. They they should have taken. They should have won the last map. I think it was like a two v two. Yeah, it was a two v two. But I don't know. Maybe he might have fumbled it. Maybe he heard someone really close or something. It might have been his own teammate. And I guess the nerve just got to him. And yeah, or maybe yeah. he was like, I don't know. I, was, I I didn't get to see it like because the the cam the, the camera perspective wasn't like too clear. I think, I think but, it looked like he tried to plant for B main, which is like directly out. Yeah, in the but that, then, that's then that's what were, I was thinking too. They were calling. I guess they heard the ropes. They heard the ropes like go up to heaven. So they're like. No, 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 go plan like default stuff like that. Yeah, right? yeah, that, that's yeah. what I was thinking too. I think it was something like he was planning somewhere and then they were like, no, don't plan there, plan here instead. And then, you know, they just didn't have enough time, Um, which is, you know, a big communication error uh, overall. Now, uh, Fnatic on the hand looking pretty good, Um, but then in their next game, um, wait, let me actually pull up. So the next game after they face uh, FPX and all, in you know a two one map uh uh what's it called a two one score line overall um but yeah FPX officially take uh the what do you call it take the ch- uh, spot for Masters which I think has been rebranded to Challengers Final because it's not international anymore or it's not on land anymore um but yeah I mean FPX looking like the the more tactical uh sound team overall I think this game kind of showed that Fnatic also has like um, a little bit of a map pool issue. Their bind looks, Fnatic's bind still looks incredible. Um, their other maps they still need to work on. Uh, if they're able to master other maps like they have their bind, then they would easily be like, honestly, a top three team in my opinion. Well, Fnatic are currently known right now in EU to be one of the most tactical teams, right? Because you can't really yeah. like, 
you can't really name like money players and Fnatic versus all the other teams. You can probably mm-hmm. name like, those breakout stars. So the fact that they're still winning the games just because they have better tactics, strategy, executes, just generally, generally, generally just a better team structure. I don't like again. I don't know. I can't. It's hard to, for me to comment on some EU stuff because I don't really watch EU that much, and the way the EU format is brought out, you can't really actually watch half the matches. Yeah, it's it's really unfortunate. I mean, at least they changed the format so that there's more best of threes now, which is really good. Um, but I don't know. It, it's like it's just kind of interesting with the match. Like people kind of call Fnatic the the mini um, FPX or like the FPX Junior. Mm-hmm. And uh, in some ways, like I guess you can kind of see that FPX are like a very tactically strong team. Um, they definitely have some firepower, but I think overall it's, like, it's just that their tactics are a lot more stronger than uh, anything else. And I think when you call Fnatic FPX Junior, that's definitely there's definitely some truth to that. It's just that Fnatic just need to flesh out their map pool more. It's like they've they have bind like mastered essentially, but their other maps are just I don't know like they just haven't spent enough time on it as it seems um yeah uh taking a look at the uh rest of the uh the bracket here so we also had nip qualify um over g2 um which we well i mean g2 also qualified but you know nip winning winning the uh the seeding match um and then heretics beating og now the heretics og match not very good but um interesting to note that lowell finally back playing for heretics and uh mm-hmm. Nice, I I can't say his name. Nice Nice W Nice W Nice W Nice Sure, but how are you say his name? He was still subbed out. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Uh, Heretics like they were the ones that win first strike. I guess it's finally good to see them. You know, uh, actually qualify compared to last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. Uh, good for them, I guess. You know, great for Heretics. Good showing from them. And considering with all the drama concerning Nisio, I guess this win, you said he was subbed out, right? Uh, yeah, he was subbed out for all this event. Uh, Lowell was subbed out before because he had like a, like a, a finger infection or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he was subbed in for the last map, but Nisio never really came back, which was... This is really good for the org itself mm-hmm. and to get the other players, but Nisio at this point is not looking too good because he has those... He has those cheats, those cheating accusations against him. I think artists, artists from D two, are is always just always just saying on Twitter like, "Hey, like when is this guy getting a band? You know, because he's cheating." Uh, let's, I don't know. Uh, speaking of which, there was like a little bit of drama too with um, Heretics and uh, Chakalaka, which they faced in the match right before this uh, this match against OG um, and. Apparently there was a lot of accusations of cheating coming out from players from Heretics, like within like the game match chat, uh, mm-hmm. which you know was covered up. But um, later on, it, it got out, and there was, there was like a bit of drama around it. And uh, I don't know, watching the game, like there was definitely like stuff that I could see as suspect, but there was no evidence that like really like confirmed in my mind that they were guilty one way or another. So I don't know. I guess like we'll have to see if like Riot actually says something. It's just, I personally didn't see anything that, like, definitely made me think, like, ah, yes, this team is definitely cheating. But there was definitely some stuff where I could see, like, mm, I can see why people think they might be cheating, but, you know, there could be this or this that, mm. you know, allowed them to do that. Yeah, at this point, it's nothing more than speculation, so we're going to have to see what they'll do. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I think that really also covers it for the E scene. I'm not really, is there anything else that you wanted to cover in terms of, you know, Valorant overall? Mm-hmm. There's nothing, nothing more. Oh, nothing. Okay, yeah, I think that really covers it for the for the Valorant section then. So, Isaac, uh, we'll turn it back to you. Okay, and I'm back. Uh, so, that's our show for today. Uh, we did go over League of Legends earlier in the scene. Uh, earlier in the the video, so if you want to catch that uh, section, the YouTube video will be uploaded within the next week. Um, so be on the lookout for that. It's the it's under the same account, I I T Esports, but on YouTube instead of Twitch. You can also go back into the VOD and on uh, the Twitch channel and watch that. Uh, other than that, I mean, we we're basically wrapped up for today. Uh, 
So thank you to Awesome and Eric, who talked about Valorant today, and uh, Andrew left, but uh, thank you to him as well. Is there anything you guys want to say before we uh, cut stream? Uh, Eric, you first. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, I was, I was gonna, I was gonna do something stupid like I don't know, plug my stream, but you know, I'm not gonna do that. Okay. Uh, awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Mallcast, you know, uh, on the weeks that are every that are you know not the weeks where esports is going on. Um, other than that, you know, not so much. I think Overwatch League schedule is finally announced for April, so I guess in April we'll be able to talk oh, about yeah. that too. But yeah. Oh, yeah, we also had a what in house for Overwatch yesterday. How'd that go? Oh yeah, it went really well. You know, uh, a lot of people showed up both in and outside of uh the school, and uh, I think you know, it kind of just again again goes to show how like great these community events are not only for growing the community but also just you know having the community more involved with each other. Um, so we'll definitely be looking out to do more of those. Just keeping an eye an eye out in you know the announcement chat at, on our Discord at IIT Esports. Um. And you know, if you're interested in participating, participate. I mean, it's they're not for only students or alumni at IIT. They're open to literally anybody and everybody. So, yeah, as long yeah. as you're not permanent. I made my triumphant return too for one game. <laughs> I was dragged yeah. out of retirement. No, it's it was good fun. You know, over Overwatch is Overwatch, but uh, we'll have another community event coming out uh within probably the next couple of months, right? Yeah. I mean, well, I actually I think even sooner than that because we try to do like around two a month or like some like yeah, somewhere like that. around that rate. Yeah, so so yeah, I mean look out for one soon. Uh we might yeah, be doing do. like a legend event soon or something, but yeah. yeah. You do Apex kill race, somehow. No yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's that's it from all of us. So from the Resports cast and from IIT Esports, we wish you all a good night and uh, for the radio people, a good afternoon because this will be airing in the afternoon on Friday. Um, so if you want to catch it on the radio, it is on the episode is going to air on the 26th on WIIT. I do not know the frequency because I probably should know that, but uh, it's on WIIT. And for the people joining us from the radio, uh, you can catch us on sh lo uh, on stream at twitch.tv slash IIT Esports. Uh, our next episode will be March 7th, uh, probably going to be streaming at 7 p.m. once again. Uh, that, again, that's at twitch.tv slash IIT Esports. Other than that, uh, we wish you a good night or a good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from, and uh, take care. <laughs>